Hey everybody, how's it going? This is Seth and Jaren, and you're listening to the RE Tipster Podcast. Today we've got a unique opportunity to chat with a pretty well-known real estate attorney named Clint Coons. So Clint is one of the founding partners of Anderson Law Group, and he's grown his legal and tax firm to over 200 employees by assisting real estate investors in creating and implementing solid entity structuring plans. Um, Clint is also an active investor and content creator. He's got a great YouTube channel, a really respectable following, and he's put out a lot of good information uh, out, out into the internet. And uh, Clint is actually a really unique person to follow because he can speak about a lot of legal issues without having to give this usual disclaimer of "I'm not an attorney" because he is an attorney. And uh, it's kind of uh, it's kind of hard to find people who are both in the real estate investing world and their legit attorneys. So he kind of understands a lot of what real estate investors need to be thinking about and looking at because uh, this is the world that he operates in. And uh, in this interview, I wanted to sort of take stock of all the most common questions that we hear again and again from other real estate investors, from other land investors. Um, and also just a lot of those common questions that I come across myself so we can just kind of grill Clint on, on all these things and get as much information as we can from him. And uh, I don't know if he's going to have the answers to literally everything because there's a lot of different stuff and a lot of ground we're going to cover here, but we're just going to throw him out there and see what he has to say about it. So I'm not going to waste a whole lot of time. We're going to jump right into this because we've got a pretty big list. So Clint, how you doing? Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. I'm doing great. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm trying to think of where it makes the most sense to start here, but um, one of the issues that I've thought about a lot, and it's a common question I get from other people, particularly in the world of vacant land investing, is the issue of liability insurance. So if somebody owns a vacant lot, you know, most typically in a rural setting, there's not a whole lot of people around. Um, what kind of insurance do people, like, what kind of insurance would you recommend that people get in that situation? And uh, is there like a certain type of provider they should be getting that from? Or like, how does that whole piece? Well, yeah. So, all right. So with broad land, the question always comes up is, what is your liability if somebody gets hurt on the property? And I can put it in context. When I was a kid growing up, uh, I grew up out of 20 some acres and we had different pastures where we would rotate. We had about, I don't know, maybe 10, 12 cows. We'd rotate them around. So they eat grass down. There's this one we called our outer pasture. My brother and I and the neighbor kids, we would shoot BB guns. At we call it BB gun wars. This is before paintballs, right? So you had to you hit somebody with that. I remember one time I was running and my brother and this guy named Matt Kelly, they were shooting me. BBs were whizzing by my head. And there happened to be this old foundation of a schoolhouse that had been built there, I don't know, 150 years ago. It burned down. I was going to seek cover there. And I heard my brother closing in on me. And all of a sudden, I heard somebody start screaming. So I stopped. And I turned around. And the ground had actually opened up. And my brother had fallen through or, or into a well. Now, he didn't fall the way down. He actually caught himself on the uh, on the edge of it. And he's just hanging there. And it wasn't that far of a drop down into this well. But no one knew about it because grass and dirt had covered it up. And, and finally, those boards just happened to give way when my brother's trying to shoot me with a BB gun. So I walk up to him. He's like, help me out. I'm like, the hell? You're trying to shoot me with a BB gun. But <laughs> the point of the story is this. Once we knew about that dangerous defect on the property, you're under an obligation to fill it in. So my dad had to bring out the backhoe, fill it in. You just couldn't throw some boards over the top, more dirt on it and say, oh, well, there we go. We've fixed the problem because now you're responsible to someone who would trip and fall into that well in the future because it's an undiscovered defect. Once you know about it, you're under a duty to protect against that. Whereas the individual that crosses onto your property, just, you know, Say you have it, you should post it, no trespassing. And they trespass on there, they fall down and a stick goes through their eye. You're not liable for that. Now, there are some notable exceptions. You look at Pennsylvania. I remember there's a number of years ago, there was a situation where some hunters were hunting on someone's property and they have, we had a blind built there. 
And the owner actually knew that people would hunt on his property and he didn't post it. I think a guy fell out of the blind and his gun went off and he shot himself and maybe he's disabled or killed. I don't recall the details, but the owner was held liable because they knew people were engaging in that activity on the property. So they were brought to a higher standard. So when it comes to raw land investing, this question comes up a lot. How exposed am I? Well, depending on the steps that you take in the land, if it's just a lot and it's just dirt, you don't really have a lot of liability. I'd get a general liability policy. I, I would contact either your typical provider, maybe you use another nationwide group and you get a policy that covers everything. But you don't have a lot to be concerned about. Whereas if it's property, and this is what comes up a lot, people buy land that was formerly used maybe for cattle, something like that. Like I, I worked on this project when I was in law school where Home Depot was buying this property. They bought, they're in the process of buying, the, I don't know, it's 40 acres from uh, this farmer, a rancher, well, not rancher, but anyways, when they bought the land, what they ended up doing was a phase two environmental study. And they had found that all of the posts that he'd used, fence posting, back then they would cover them in cre uh, creosote. I used to bury the same things in our property. You know, you plant them and then eventually they wear out. And then what do you do with them? Well, you didn't burn them. A lot of times people would bury them. So they buried, the guy had buried these. This went on for years. And it wasn't necessarily this. Well, they found that there had been contamination spots on the. So in negotiations that affected the, the uh, price because there's remediation that needed to be done. So when I look at land, one of the things I often tell people is I wouldn't be so worried about the trespasser, just post no trespassing, get some general liability policy there, insurance on that property. But be more concerned, I think, is about the environmental contamination that could potentially be there. So no going into it that that's a liability. And in that case, you sh you're not going to be able to typically receive a policy, get a policy. So put it in an LLC, something that limits your liability exposure. Otherwise, you'll end up like a bank in southern Washington state. About 20 years ago, they foreclosed on another guy that had a bunch of land. And the guy was so pissed off, he took all of his, his uh, chemicals and went out on the back 40 and dumped all the chemicals and collected them from his buddies and diesel fuel. Bank bought the took the property back in foreclosure. Then he called up the EPA and said, "Hey, there's some seven-legged raccoons crawling around on this property. I think you got to go out there. In fact, I, I think I saw a fish walk up onto shore the other day. And sure enough, they found the land that had been contaminated. That guy has no assets, right? He's the one that did it. But now the bank owns this property, and they bought themselves a liability. Interesting. So that's how I approach it. Yeah, and is it?" The environmental issue is really an issue for commercial property, right? Does that apply to residential too? It can apply to any land. We had a client in uh, Colorado that rented a house to an individual who was running an auto body repair shop, unlicensed auto body repair shop. And this was on a lease option agreement. The guy totally blew it. The, the, the client that we're working with, uh, he entered into a lease option with this individual that said, hey, you can buy it in two years at its fair market value. He didn't set the, the minimum price for it. Guy runs this uh, unlicensed auto body repair shop there, unbeknownst to the owner of the property. So this is residential. Dumps all the oil and everything antifreeze onto the ground. Took property that was conceivably should have been worth about $800,000, decreased it value to $400,000 because of the remediation that was required to fix it. And it had, had um, gone on to the adjoining property. So it had flowed down onto the adjoining property. And he said, I'm going to buy the land. And the guy fought him. He said, no way, I'm not going to sell it to you for $400,000. It's worth eight hundred. dollars Well, it needs remediation. Long story short, the tenant actually won because the landlord put the, or the owner put together the lease agreement so it was held against him and he had to pay his attorney's fees. So when you think about it in those terms, you can contaminate any property. In fact, when I was growing up as a kid, I grew up in a real estate background. That's why I'm so involved today in, in buying properties. And many times when I would drive by on the way out to the dump, what you would find is that people would dump stuff on any vacant land they could find rather than going to the dump. Because as the transfer stations now, as they call them, garbage dumps, begin to restrict what you can bring to them. And they make it more difficult for you to dispose 
of what they call hazardous materials. Many people don't have the money nor the time to deal with it. So they'll just dump it on property. So you can't that if you're not, you're going to have somebody looking over your property. To me, that's the great. Yeah. I mean, if like, uh, I mean, what you're saying all makes sense. And it's actually kind of odd to me that uh, people don't, I mean, I'm, on one hand, I'm glad because it would be a huge pain. But on the other hand, uh, it's kind of weird how, you know, it's regular to order phase one environmental reports and all this stuff on commercial properties, but nobody does with this with residential when it's, it's kind of just as susceptible. I mean, maybe it's less likely because people aren't going to contaminate their own homes, but still like there's no rules saying you can't contaminate that property. No, but you get an idea for it. I mean, you would know when you went out there, uh, the extent of it. I mean, you know, we've all done this, right? You change oil in your truck. If there's a vacant lot next to you, yep. What do you do with it? You know, you either pour it in your property, you go over the vacant lot, and like, oh, what the hell? Nobody's living here. <laughs> you just empty it there. I did that when I was 22 years old. But so, so let's say you had a hundred people doing that, then you could run into a problem. But you would know that, of course, when you're looking at the property, you get a sense for it when you see that no grass is growing in a you know, 20 foot square area. You might be going, well, what's going? On? Yeah. In terms of the the liability protections, just thinking that practically for a land flipper who buys and sells a vacant lot and they own it for like at most a few months, maybe in a, even a few weeks, like, do you think, is it really worth going through the gyrations of always getting, you know, calling up the insurance provider and making sure that one lot is insured and then taking it back off a few weeks later when it sells? Like, uh, do you think there's a case to be made for just not bothering with it at all or like? Should it always be done as a matter of policy? What do you think? Well, what I think is this, is that I wouldn't go and create a whole bunch of LLCs and things like that if you're just flipping land. I think that's a waste of money and time. What I would do is I would have one entity set up, and we'll probably talk about this later, and it, you would take title in that one entity. And then what I would do is I would work with a national insurance company you know, there's Point Chubb's one of them, National Real Estate Insurance Group is one of them. And, and I think there's one other one that I've heard of. And what they'll typically do is they'll allow you to add properties and move them off. And so if you only have it for, for 30 days, they'll insure it just for that 30 day period. You get onto their portals, people told me, and then you remove it. So it's a small amount of money. And I always look at things, you know, what is the, the cost versus the benefit? The likelihood of anything occurring, very, very small. But that one deal that goes bad on you, I mean, how much is that going to cost you relative to, to acquiring a little insurance? Maybe the policy is 150 bucks because they realize that the, the, the risk is very, very small, but it's worth having. I'm over here uh, just soaking it all in. This is a, a really good interview. I'm like, I get asked so much about um, different legal stuff. I'm not an attorney, so I have to always be like, I don't know, go talk to somebody who knows what they're doing. But now we actually have somebody who uh, knows what they're talking about. So I'm really excited about this interview. Um, what are some of the most common legal disputes um, or, or lawsuits that come up with vacant land properties? Um, aside from, uh, uh, never mind, we'll start there and then I'll ask my second question. Yeah, it's always going to be boundary lines. I mean, depending on where you buy it, it's, it's who has easements, who owns the property, that's going to be uh, the greatest risk, adverse possession uh, of land as well. Let's say that you buy some property and the neighbor's been mowing 20 feet onto your property for the past 15 years and maintaining that, that one section as if there was a, it, their own. You buy that, they're going to make a claim and say, hey, that's 20 feet to mine. That may screw up your ability to build on that property because now you took a buildable lot. You just lost 20 feet. You can't build anything in that, that section. So that's that's the greatest risk right there. Sounds like a, a new sub niche for land flippers is to expand your holding just by mowing your neighbor's yard <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> it, can, it can be very profitable that way. <laughs> that's hilarious. Um Aside from getting insurance, is there anything that you can do to avoid disputes or liability or well, losses? Getting a, a survey on that particular issue, right? Yeah, well, you get a survey, but the survey isn't going to, it's just going to show you where, where the boundary markers are and where the lot lines are for your property. It's not necessarily going to 
lets you know if that property is being maintained and there's an adverse possession claim against it. So that's what, what you would need to do is hire someone, have someone go out there, take a look at the property and say, is there anything that is obvious to the naked eye that someone could assert that, yeah, I have 10 feet of this property because I've done X, Y, and Z. Let's say there's a fence, you know, that somebody put up there. You could, that could be an issue or some type of barrier or just a, a small wall for plantings. So those are the concerns that I have or an easement. So let's assume that um, the neighbor has been driving across that property for the past 17 years to gain access to his backyard where he built a garage. You build that, you, you buy that property and you want to erect a fence and a house on there, you're going to have to contend with that easement. You're going to find him some other access because now he has the right to access his backyard across your property. So, so there's lots of little things like that that come up. Water rights as well, depending if you had a well. Uh, you know, maybe they put their drain field on that property. No one knew about it. Uh, Clint, excuse my ignorance in this question, but um, just to clarify, you're saying that if somebody essentially treats the property as if it's their own in some capacity uh, for a long enough time that they'll actually have some right or claim to that particular property? Yeah. So when I, you know, this all, all came about for me that my first experience with this as a child growing up um, on that property where I grew up, my dad had about a, probably about a half acre worth of land or a little more that he had, when he bought it, it actually, it already been fenced by the previous owner. And it turns out that the fence line cut through the adjoining property owner's property. And so when that property was sold, and so this would have been probably 28 years later, this one little corner lot was sold, maybe it's three and a half acres. When they ran a survey, what they found is that my father's land encroached onto their land via that fence by, I don't know, 50 yards, let's assume. And they tried to want to tear my dad's fence down and say, oh no, that's our land. I was like, whoa, hold on a minute. Said that fence has been there for 30 years. That's my property. I've run animals on it. That's no longer your property. And so of course a lawsuit came from it and they lost. Um, and my father kept the property and they readjusted the uh, legal description for his land to account for it. Wow, interesting. So that is a viable strategy, Seth. Like we could yeah. just start mowing our neighbor's lawn and long enough, we'll just get a bunch of property. Wow. Yeah, yeah, but you have to be careful on that. So, <laughs> so, so my father was aware of this issue. And then where I grew up, there was a county road that cut through uh, my, my parents' property. And so when he bought, he owned, you know, up to where we had the fence. And then on the other side of this little county road, there was a house kind of sloping. My dad owned about 70 feet up that neighbor's property and the neighbor would mow it all the time but my father would always go over there and let him know hey this is my property and so he kept him aware of the fact that he owned that property you know sometimes you know he'd send my brother and i over there and we would just you know sit in a chair in the grass he goes, i want you to sit over for a couple hours i go what are you doing that for just let him know that's our property and not his <laughs> so they couldn't assert that by mowing it, they claimed ownership. Because in order to claim ownership under adverse possession, you have to state that it's been hostile and adverse to the owner and that you took it under a claim of right. So there's certain things you have to go through. If the owner puts you aware, makes you aware of the fact that they own the property and they're aware of what you're doing, then it doesn't, doesn't work. Hmm. And I'm assuming the time frame um, is probably specific to each state, right? Yeah, it's, you're, you're typically looking at seven or 10 years, depending on how you acquire it. It's really interesting. Well, there was a uh, there was a video I made a few years ago um, where I was talking about a special kind of survey marker where basically once you get a survey and the surveyor has put the stakes there, you know, you as the property owner can get the survey marker. It's basically like this metal disc that you just put in the ground. You can mow over it whenever you want, but it's a marker showing, hey, this is where the surveyor put that stake. I remember making I making this a YouTube video about it, just saying, hey. Look at this thing. This is how it works. And there was this guy. I don't know if he was just an internet troll or if he knew what he was talking about, but 
he left multiple comments saying like, I'm a surveyor and what you're saying here is illegal. Only a surveyor can put a survey marker on a property. Because apparently people like me could just as well put that survey marker closer onto their neighbor's property and like lie. And uh, I don't know, I'm just making me wonder, like in terms of informing your neighbor that it's your property, like, is that a viable way to do it? To just have that survey marker there? Or do you have to like have some kind of conversation or paper trail or something like that? No, you need to make it open and notorious. So if that's why I said mowing the lawn, putting up a fence, doing something to show you're putting that property to you. See, this whole basis of adverse possession stems back from the common law of England, where they didn't want land to sit fallow no one to do anything with it because if you're not making land productive then it do does not generate tax revenue it doesn't feed people so back then this is the thing we wanted to make sure that the land was always being worked and tilled and crops were coming in because that fed the populace and brought in money for the crown so that embodiment of our law has you know encapsulated that into how we approach land today and that we want to ensure that people don't just sit there buy land and sit on it. Now, I know there's environmental concerns and all that's come about as of late, but still, it still works that way. If you take some property and you put it to productive use or you start using it, the, the law will award you that property if it's done for a certain period of time, open, notorious, and hostile to any other claims the way they, they state it. So it can't be what you're doing I'm going to bury something or just put that little disc there. That's not open and notorious. No one would know that. So you got to do more. Mm. Okay. And actually, this is sort of a follow-up question to the earlier thing we were talking about with liability. So as I understand it right, that if you just put a sign on your property saying no trespass, like that technically is supposed to get you off the hook if somebody hurts themselves. But if you don't have that sign there, then you could be liable. Okay. Gotcha. Ah, no, I'm not saying I'm not saying one way or the other. It just helps to. Have. All right, so I'll give you another example. I got tons of them from growing up. So we used to uh, kids get off the school bus and they would cut across this field that was owned by the neighbor. And there was a path that went through there. And we used to ride bikes out there as well and ride our horses in that that, that area. So the neighbor knew about this. And on that particular property, there were some large holes and divots, and there was actually some uh, cement blocks that at one time they had weather balloons tied up there. So when you know that people are using your property and you don't take any steps to prevent them from using it, then you're held to a higher standard. So if you know the kids are walking across this path and there's anything dangerous there and they get hurt, you could be held technically liable in those mm -hmm. situations. Or if you see kids like we used to do, we would take those big cement blocks and we would build a ramp and then take our uh, bicycles or my buddy had a, a, it was not a quad, it had three wheels and we'd build this huge ramp and try to jump off the thing. You see that going on and you don't take steps to dismantle that and stop us from doing it. And we were to flip that thing back and land on our heads and kill ourselves, you're liable. Uh, man, I just don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, it's like... But here's the thing. I mean, you're not holding on to it for very long anyways. You're in and out of the property. So these types of issues wouldn't necessarily affect you. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're, your best defense is always going to be ignorance. If I, sell, so if I own a piece of property for three months and I flip it to someone else, that becomes their as long as you're not put on own, uh, notice of it, you're not going to have to disclose. But once you know about stuff, like this residential property in uh, Idaho, guy sold the house in November in the fall time to this couple. They buy the property, come springtime, you know, it's really weird. Garden snakes, or they, well, first they smell it, and then they see the snakes in their house. My wife's out there cooking breakfast, and snake comes out from under the stove wakes up at night, steps on a garden snake in her bedroom, you know, one o'clock in the morning. And like, what the hell is this? Well, they bring someone out, what they find out, because the smell is just overpowering. This house was built over in a cavern. And this empty cavern was filled with garden snakes. It would come and they would congregate in there in the wintertime because it's so cold to preserve their body heat. And this big roiling mass or something you'd see in 
uh, Indiana Jones movie or something like that. And then as soon as it got warm, they're like party time and they want to take off. And this house happened to be sitting over and they'd come up through the foundation into the house and not all of them, but, you know, and so what they found out when, later on is that he sued the seller and they said, you didn't disclose this information. And actually, they did disclose it on their disclosure. They wrote snakes and they just didn't ask. Um, but so, so that's an example of, you know, when you're selling property, if you didn't know about it, then you're not going to be held liable. And if you do sell property, and you know about it, you definitely want to disclose it. And it's and depend on the state where you buy red states versus blue states and how they approach responsibilities, you may have to go over and beyond what you think you need to disclose in some uh, instances. Yeah. It almost makes me wonder if there's a case to be made for learning as little as you can about a property before you buy it. You know, I, I mean, I, I do. That's kind of my MO. I, I but try. At the same time, like if there is a huge glaring issue that the future buyer is going to find out about, you might as well know about it first. So I don't know. It's like, where do you draw the line? It really comes down to the state. Yeah. Uh, so here's a guy flipper flipping dilapidated houses in Virginia and DC. Okay. More liberal in their approach to things. And here's what he would do. This was a couple of years ago, by the way. He would list these homes for sale on the internet, sight unseen. Say, hey, listen, I just bought the house off the internet. I've never been out to the house. If you want it, let me know. This is the price. Do your own due diligence, your own inspection. People would go out there and they would bring out bad inspectors. And they would buy these homes from this flipper only to find out later on there were a lot more issues involved with the house. And so they thought they're going to be able to do the remodel, make it a personal residence and spend 200 grand instead of the drop 400. Some of them can't even complete the projects. So who do they blame? Well, they go after the flipper that, that had been buying these homes. They sued them and they said, listen, you should have done more to let us know. And his whole defense was, what else do I have to tell you? I never even visited the property. I bought it off the internet site unseen i listed it you did your own due diligence why is it my problem and so that's a classic example of you, you know where they can go after you even though you don't know anything about it you can get enough momentum if you sell enough in a certain market like they did here where the local news station got involved they tried to assassinate his character and this is one of the reasons why i'm big on anonymity with my planning is because you don't need people like that jumping on the internet and saying you know you try to rip people off you're a slump it's not true, but they make very sympathetic plaintiffs. And so they paint the story that's most beneficial to them and their pursuit of their claim. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. To clarify, one of the reasons why I really like land compared to, to wholesaling houses or other types of real estate is because um, you don't have to approach it with that much worry about knowing too much right like but when i used to work for simple wholesaling um that was one of the uh, the pushbacks that i got as the disposition manager a lot of our potential buyers would be like well your numbers are wrong your rehab numbers are wrong like you, you know what are you doing and and i'm like well rehab numbers are extremely subjective my friend like you have to do your own due diligence and it is very subjective i've actually i actually remember one time um, I was driving down to a property to show two different potential buyers the property at the same time. And um, somebody, one of them called me on the, while I was driving there and they asked me, um, you know, uh, Jaren, how much do you think the rehab is going to be? And I said, well, I think it's going to be between 15 and 25,000. And they, and they're like, that's a very large range. Like, why would you say that? And I said, well, because to to one person there they uh hold the property and they attract tenants that are low maintenance and they don't need to update the windows and they don't need to do a bunch of stuff whereas somebody else wants you know um um wants you know the the steel appliances and the like all the fancy bells and whistles right and sure enough i walked both of those properties and one of them said 15,000 for rehab and the other one said 25 um, and you know, it's just, it goes to show you that there's so much that can go into a property. And, um, I mean, when we, every time we did a, we listed our property on, cause we would actually 
buy the property, you take title. We want to do a sign. Um, and we were licensed. So um, we would a lot of the times put our properties in the MLS. And every time it, it was just like, we don't know anything. Like we literally just had a safe template of our disclosure because we like, we just didn't, we intentionally did not. Uh, we tried to know as little about yeah. the, the state of the property as possible. Another question for you, Clint. When, when, let's talk about um, doing business in multiple states. So when you're doing deals as a land flipper in multiple states and you've got one LLC registered in one state, at what point should you, um, at what point are you considered doing business in these other states? Is it when I buy just one single property there? Is it when I buy five properties? Um, when I have employees there? When I gen generate a certain amount of money? What's kind of the, what's the cutoff point where I need to say, okay, I'm now doing business in this state. I wonder if you're the one that posted that question on my YouTube channel this weekend, because uh, I actually got that in one of my videos on land. Somebody wanting to know when you have to register in multiple states. And the thing about land is that if you own land and nothing more, it's not it does not constitute doing business in that state. So you're able to hold that one entity, let's say you set up a Wyoming, Delaware entity, and you're going to flip some properties in, in New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, and you buy a lot here and there. You don't need to register. However, now where you would need to register is going to be in those situations where you intend to actively target a specific state. So if I decided that I'm going to focus strictly on New Mexico and I'm flipping properties left and right, well, then it's going to rise to the level of a trader business, and now you're going to need to foreign file in that state. Yes. But I might recommend if you're, if you're engaging in multiple flips in one particular jurisdiction, and maybe you, you, you've grown your business now where you have two or three different states you're talking that might be a good scenario where you set up an LLC in that particular state just for those deals. So I would create a New Mexico LLC and have it owned 100% by my parent company. And then I would have a, a Texas LLC owned 100% by my parent company. So as your business expands and you start to do more, then you would look at tiering some uh, structures, layering uh, some entities on top. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So on that, like, at what point is it intent? Like, is it, okay, so if I send direct mail campaign to New Mexico, that is that officially qualifies as an, even if I only bought one property there, like I meant to do that. It wasn't just something that fell into my lap. Like, is that the threshold at which you're doing business? No, see, that's just buying. It's in, after you bought it, what are you doing with it? Like in terms of the timeline at which you plan to sell it or? You want to sell it right away, right? So as you can. So you do one isolated transaction. I don't think that's not going to rise to the level of a trader business, but it's a facts and circumstances test. So, so if it can be shown that you've engaged in multiple deals and you've been actively advertising in that state, then it, it takes on the semblance of a trader business. But what does that mean in the grand scheme of things? Well, if I have an entity that was set up in Delaware, and it's a corporation, and I buy property in New Mexico, and, I, and I'm, I flip eight properties this year, and I don't register, what's the, what's the penalty? Well, there is no penalty as long as you don't have to start a lawsuit. So why registering is so important? Because they're still going to withhold taxes. You know, I just sold a property in California two weeks ago, and they withheld taxes because it wasn't in a California LLC. It was held in a Wyoming LLC. And um, where the issue comes in is, let's assume that you sold the property and the buyer defaults on the sale. And so you go after the buyer, you could get bounced out of court. They would say that you cannot bring a claim to enforce that contract because you were not registered at the time to conduct business in this mm. state. Therefore, you lose the ability to prosecute an action. Or if you're rehabbing property and your contractor stiffs you, charges you, says the work was done and was not completed, and you weren't registered, then if you sued the 
contractor, his defense would be, he's not registered to do business here. He cannot bring this claim against me. He's an outlaw. So the remedy for you then would be to register your entity and get it compliant at that point in time and hope it's, the claim will still survive. So it's, it's not like the government is fining me or something. I just sort of don't have a leg to stand on in a court situation. Oh, no. I mean, really, the it, states have gotten really wise as to this. I mean, I don't typically set up a state-specific entity for, for my one-off deals. So about a, a property in Hawaii, just to, just to try that VRBO, Airbnb scenario a couple of years ago. And after a year and a half, I realized too much lifting for me. So I sold it, but I didn't set up a Hawaii LLC. I know that, again, I had a Wyoming LLC that I closed in title. And that's how I held title. So when I sold the property, they withheld a portion of the sale. And then what I had to do is file a tax return, show them what my basis was in the property and apply to get the, I think they with 60,000 bucks from the sale. And I had to apply to get that money back. Hmm. That's what typically happens. Gotcha. And then there, at least my understanding anyway, is that you have a couple options. You can either file for a new LLC in that state, or you can do a foreign qualification where like you keep your same LLC, you just file as a foreign one. Why, why would you do one versus the other? Like, is it kind of the same thing or is one better for some reason? Well, it depends on what you're doing. Um, if you already have the LLC set up, maybe just foreign file it. Uh, if you didn't have the LLC set up, then I you might as well just open up an LLC in that state. Because if you do the foreign filing, you're going to have an RA fee and a state fee in the home jurisdiction. And then you're going to have another fee in the uh, foreign jurisdiction as well, RA fee and annual filing fee. So what does it really gain you? It doesn't really gain you much unless there's a large business strategy at play that we're focusing on. Mm -hmm. So suppose I'm starting a remote land flipping business from scratch and I live in Michigan, but all the properties that I want to buy are in California and possibly some other states. So given that, which state should I establish my LLC in? Like what basis do I use for making this initial decision? And, and along the way, like I, I know you talked about having an LLC in Wyoming. Mm -hmm. Like why that? Or why Delaware or Nevada or these other state LLCs we always hear about? Okay. So in your situation, it's different. When you're running a business that produces income that you classify as active income, which is flipping, you're going to be drawn a salary from your business, or if it's disregarded, you're going to be a sole proprietor. So whenever I'm focusing on those types of structures or dealing with those types of real uh, investor clients, we're going to set them up with, a, with an entity that's typically treated as an S or a C corp in the state where they reside. I mean, I could, we could set it up in Wyoming or Delaware or something like that, but we're still going to have to foreign file it in your state because in order for you to set up payroll, you got to get it registered there because you're the employee, you're working out of that, uh, out of your state and you're, you're performing the services there. So for this type of activity, I'm typically going to start with your home state. And a lot, you know, a lot of times people say, well, I want anonymity. I don't want people to know that I own this business. Okay, I can still accomplish that. We'll set up an LLC in Michigan that's owned by a Wyoming LLC, and I'll give you complete anonymity, and we'll treat it as a C corp for tax purposes, and cut your tax rate down to twenty one percent on all your income that you're not taking out personally. We could do that, but by and large, you still need a home state entity, no matter how we skin this cat. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Again, excuse my ignorance here. I. I uh... Sometimes I have to dumb it down a bit. I move a little slow sometimes. But in my understanding, you right, Clint, when you're saying that if you're just doing one-off property randomly in a, in a different state, don't worry about filing a, an entity there or you know, foreign filing or getting an LLC base there. Um, but if your intent is to do business in that state or to do multiple business transactions at that point, you you should probably register. Like, I guess what I'm trying to get at is I'm really trying to narrow in on where is the line? Like, where is 
the the tipping point where it's like, okay, now you've crossed into the territory where it's time to go ahead and register in that state. Okay, I'll give you the perfect example to what I did in Hawaii. Because I hadn't hadn't really planned on this, it was just something that came out of the blue and I put it together. If I had to go back and, and redo that investment, I would have taken that Wyoming LLC and foreign file it in Hawaii, or I would have set up a Hawaii LLC for this property because of the withholding taxes on the sale. Because I was a foreign entity and they withheld so much from the gross proceeds of the sale of that property, I didn't have $60,000 for about seven, six, seven months because I'd file the tax returns and request the money back from the state. So it took a while for me to go through this process to get my funds back. Now, if I'm relying upon you know, the funds to put into my next deal, do you feel, are you in a financial position where you can say, all right, I'll let the state hold on to 15 grand out of my sale? Or do you want that money so you can keep turning it? If you want that money so you can keep turning it, then I would set up an LLC in that state. First, figure out what the laws are and the withholding on the sale of real estate to see if they distinguish between a foreign company or foreign resident owning property versus a resident of that state. And an LLC set up in, for instance, California is considered to be a resident of California. So you would want to know the taxation of that particular pro or of property sales in that state to see what the, what the holding is to make that determination. Okay. So I've got uh, one of these questions where there's like a bunch of questions buried inside it. It's like uh, interview it, within an interview. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And this has to do with uh, the issue of being looked at as a dealer versus an investor by the IRS. Um, so just right off the bat, maybe you can outline what is the difference between a dealer and an investor a dealer holds property for resale that's what they do. they don't intend to treat it as an investment to generate income from rents or for longer term long-term appreciation they're always looking to sell a great example a great case about six years ago seven years ago this individual bought a warehouse in colorado Actually, more probably more than 10. Bought this warehouse and he did a feasibility study and got all the stuff together and then tried to sell it. No buyer. So then he just sat on it, rented it out. Next year, he went in, checked the property out again, did another feasibility. He said, Oh, well, it's not, this isn't the right time. So he kept sitting on it. He sat on it for four years, but every year he did a feasibility to see whether or not it's the time to take it to market or not. He finally sold it and then claimed long-term capital gains treatment, that he held it as an investment. IRS came in and audited him. And they stated, court, it went to tax court because the IRS said, you're a dealer in property, that you didn't intend to hold this as an investment. It's like, the hell, I held this for four years, right? How do you say I'm a flipper? I didn't turn around and just sell it. They said, yeah, but your intent, that's what we're focused on. What was your intent? Your intent was to sell the property. The fact that you couldn't sell it is not relevant in the analysis of whether or not you're a dealer or an tax court agreed. And they said by him performing that feasibility study every year to look at the property to see if market conditions were right for him to sell it, put him in the, in the category of a dealer and not an investor. Gotcha. So for somebody who's flipping vacant land in, you know, selling stuff within 12 months with intent. It's pretty clear we're all considered dealers, right? I mean, that's They're all buyers. Yeah. And what are, the, what are the tax or legal implications of being a dealer versus an investor? Well, if you do it in your own name or you do it through a disregarded LLC, you're going to be treated as a Schedule C filer. Mm -hmm. um, so now all the income is considered active income to you. It's going to be subject to 15.4% employment taxes up to the threshold and it'll just drop down to the 3.6, whatever it is, Medicaid tax. Uh, on top of that, you're going to lose the ability to engage in installment sales. So this is the this is the major problem that our flipping clients face. A lot of them flip properties in, in the Texas market on installment sales, lease options, you know, bring someone in, lease to them, then they sell it to them. 
um, on an installment sale. And so they, they sell them the property, they take down $5,000 down and their basis, what they put into the property may be 60K and they're going to sell it for 120, but they're going to uh, amortize it out on a 30 year AM, five year payment. So they just sold that property for $120,000, but they only received 5,000 bucks and their gain eventually would be 60K. Well, the person who can engage in traditional installment sale reporting, the investor, they're going to recognize that as the money comes in. Mm -hmm. The flipper recognizes that 60K the day they enter into that installment sale. So now you've got 60K of income that you have to pay taxes on for which you only receive $5,000 thus far. Now, where do you come up with the difference? You know, go to your bank account because the IRS is going to expect that money. So people who flip property, they don't get the benefit of installment sales. They also don't get the benefit of 1031 exchanges. So you've just taken yourself out of the ability to engage in a 1031 on the disposition of an asset because it was not an investment property. So those are the three main drawbacks for people who deal. And I often tell people, you know, because of the uh, employment tax issue, the active income, we encourage those people who flip to run it through an entity that is treated as a C or an S corporation for tax purposes so you can control that. Yeah. And that's actually, um... That is one thing that does not apply to vacant land or any property that does not have a dwelling on it. And there's a little uh, <laughs> highly overlooked and very little known part of the tax code that specifies that this whole, that thing there, um, whether you're a dealer or not, that issue of having to recognize all the income at the time of sale, it applies to everything except when there's no dwelling on it and it's residential. Yeah, um, yeah, because it hasn't been put into use yet. I forgot that one. Thanks yeah, for... yeah. yeah. Um, I, I know that's significant because I remember the first time I heard about that, I was like, mm -hmm. "What? Are you kidding yep. me? This like destroys everything." Until I found out about that. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it hasn't been put into use yet. Yep, I remember that. It, See, and my I'm... blonde hair. It's just getting older. <laughs> no, no problem. It, but it makes me wonder, though. So you also mentioned the thing about. Uh, as a sole proprietor or a disregarded entity. So if you declared yourself as an S corp or a C corp, does that get you off the hook in some way? It just gives you control over your receipt of income. If you're a sole proprietor, you have no control. If you make $175,000, all active income to you. Whereas with an S corp, you can cut the employment taxes by taking out a distribution uh, from your S corp, or if it's a C corp, if you, you know, let's assume that you and your wife, you're, you're working and you're, you're pulling in two fifty, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 a year. You're doing really well. And you don't want to pay, uh, 37% on that $200,000 you made from flipping. So you leave it inside of your corp and it's only taxed at 21%. The benefit being that now you've got more money to put into more deals the following year. So it puts more money back in your pocket. And if you need the money, you know, loan it to yourself. I mean, take, to pay yourself a reasonable salary. Always have to do that. But it just gives you more control. I'm, I'm a fan of C corporations because of the control feature that if it doesn't come down, if it's, I don't need it, I leave it there. And I will go toe to toe with any CPA every day of the week when they say, well, C corporations result in double taxation and they complain about it. To put on your tax bracket, that is just a, a, a saying that they parrot over and over again without analyzing the individual. If you're in a 15% tax bracket effective, yes, yeah, C corporation doesn't make sense. If you're in a 37% tax bracket, you'll pay less in tax with a C corp and a dividend than you would if you just took it into your own. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually a good point because that, that's in my mind. Every time I hear C Corp, I go back to the first book I ever read about this with the double taxation thing. And I was like, nope, not going to do it because of that. But you're right. I mean, there's there's always a situation. I mean, you got to look at the specifics of your own financial picture and whether that makes sense or not. Um, yeah. It, it, and I'm wondering, it, is it possible to, to be considered a dealer for one property, but an investor for another? It's not like you get this label that just applies to everything, right? It depends on each specific deal. Yeah, it's going to depend on the deal. And the reason why we like to separate out the activities is that we want the corporation to be the dealer. 
you to be the investor. So any deals you intend to treat as an investment, you run them through disregarded LLCs or a partnership that flows back onto your 1040 Schedule E to keep that dealer stuff inside of the company. So there's this clear line as to where investor ends and dealer begins. It begins in a separate tax paying mm -hmm. entity. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. This uh, tax issue is something that a lot of land investors, I don't know, it's kind of a disappointing thing because for most real estate investors, there's all kinds of tax advantages. But for land, you know, depreciation is not a thing. Um, kind of get left out in the cold in a lot of ways. In your knowledge or from their, your experience, is there any creative way for a land investor or land flipper to cut their taxes? Or is it pretty much just the way that you structure your entities and kind of what we just talked about in terms of which properties you buy and which, uh, which names? Or is there other stuff we could do to pay less in taxes? Not on land. I mean, it's how you buy it, the yeah. entity that owns it. Maybe you're buying land through a solo or a self-directed IRA or a corporation. So those are the ways in which you can control some of that income. Gotcha. So when it, when it comes to selling land with, um, with terms, with seller financing, um, you know, land contract or deed of trust, how important is it to record a memorandum or some evidence of the outstanding transaction? Definitely important. You want to file a deed of trust against that property or a mortgage. Right. Did they do uh, in Washington where you're at, Clint, did they do land contract or contract for deed? Yeah, they're, they're recognized. And I would record that if you sold it that way. You always want to make sure that there's some record so that the buyer doesn't sell the property out from underneath you and you don't get notified and you don't get paid off. Yeah. So there are some people that have the idea um, it's easier to repossess the property if nothing is recorded um, to cloud the title. So like, for example, in Florida, um, a lot of people, if they do a land contract, they'll, and a lot of land investors will in intentionally not record it with um, at all because if they have to foreclose, they have to go through like a six uh, judicial foreclosure process that's super annoying and cumbersome. Whereas if they don't, they can just automatically assume back control of the property. So right. do, you, do you feel like, like what's, I guess the ultimate question is like, what's the right path to go here? Like, should we always be recording it? Cause like you said, you brought up a, a really good point that having public record of, of something prevents uh, a borrower from, from selling the property from underneath you. But at the flip side, like if they default, you have to, if you're in a judicial foreclosure state, then you have to go through that process. From the seller standpoint in a land contract, title doesn't transfer until the actual land contract is paid. So the seller is not going to record it. If I'm representing the buyer, I'm telling them to record that agreement to prevent the seller from selling that property out from underneath me so that the world is put on notice that I have an interest in that. So if anybody who bought that property didn't record it, they're going to be at risk. And, and, you know, as someone who, would, who works with buyers like that, I would say you definitely need to have that recorded. Yeah, I think it kind of goes both ways because, I mean, really either party could try to do something malicious to the other. I mean, if they're really going to be a jerk about it, um, you know, the, the borrower could try to, I don't know, build something on the property or build a house before it's paid off. Whereas, you know, in that case, a lender would pull a title search and see that. And be like, are they, well, you are they, uh, they might mow the lawn, right, Seth? For yeah, seven, exactly. seven to ten years, just, just something really nasty, like mow the lawn. <laughs> but, but yeah, it's it's uh, I, the attorneys I've talked to about this. Like the attorney answers, like absolutely, always recorded because it's going to protect both parties. And and like so, like, that's always kind of the stance I've taken. But the problem with a lot of land flippers is that a lot of times people are selling properties on seller financing with a land contract without doing any kind of credit or background check. They don't know anything about the financial standing of this person. And like, it's not uncommon at all for people to just stop paying pretty early on in the process. And when that happens, there's this cloud on the title and it's this huge pain to get rid of. Um, so some people have this idea of, well, just don't record it and you're fine. But then another attorney answer that I've heard is, even if you don't record it, that doesn't necessarily fix the problem because all that borrower would have to do if they ever made a single payment to you 
is go to a judge and say, look, I've got this signed contract and here's proof of my payment. So now I have an equitable interest in this property. And right. then they've got a huge title issue later on. So it's, it's like, whether you record it or not, the problem is technically still there until you go through the right motion. You need to know your state law because sometimes what can come up, if you're involved in a land contract for the sale of the land and you've been it for say over a year, then you have an equitable interest in the property. And in order to remove that person in some states, as I understand it, you actually have to go through a traditional foreclosure process. And it's not just as simple as I just boot them out. So knowing each state, if, if you're going to do a land contract, let's say in North Carolina, find an attorney that understands land contracts, then ask that attorney, or, what are my obligations? If I need to kick someone out and take back possession of the property, can I do it through an unlawful detainer action? Or do I have to go through a foreclosure? What's that process look like? So you know going into it, what could go if something goes wrong what steps you need to take to rectify it yeah yeah gotcha so really in terms of when that land contract memorandum or whatever is recorded in terms of how to get rid of that in mm -hmm. that scenario of a default that's really a conversation to have with an attorney right in that state yeah, just in absolutely of, in yeah. that state yeah. so if you called me up and say hey, clint what do i do in uh colorado on a land contract call a Col colorado attorney yeah, gotcha. Yeah. And you're, sense. are you uh, primarily in Washington? Do you do stuff in any other state? Well, yeah, we, so we set up entities all over the U.S. I mean, um, you were talking about, you said 200. We're actually up to 347 employees. Wow. Now. That's huge. Holy it cow. is huge. Yeah, it's, and uh, we got a lot of attorneys and in, in, in we work in all 50 states. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So another question here regarding seller financing. So if the goal is really just to allow a buyer to pay for the property in installments, like just giving them an easy financing option so they don't have to cough up all the cash right now, is it a viable alternative to use a lease purchase or a lease option instead of a land contract or a deed of trust? Um, some have theorized that if a buyer stops making payments on a lease, you know, in some form, uh, it would be easier to repossess the property or terminate that agreement when you compare it to a land contract or a deed of trust, which is like a formal loan document with a person in a deed of trust, like they would actually own it. But on a land contract, there's like a very clear path to ownership. I'm just wondering, like, is there any merit to that or is it all kind of the same thing with just different wording? Well, I mean, it's all, here's what it would come down to. Let's say I did a lease purchase for someone. I need to know whether or not that lease, lease option, you know, lease option, let's say, needs to be recorded. Because in certain states, and we take Washington state here, you know, two year lease agreement needs to be recorded. So you'd have to record it. Why? So that puts everyone on notice. If you buy property, if you're selling property like that under this lease option agreement and it's raw land, I think there's an argument to be made by the purchaser. Let's say they miss one payment. You say, oh, deal's over. That the intent of structuring it was an installment sale and that you're using the word lease option to get around any of the other requirements that would be in place to you know, foreclose on the property. Because at the end of the day, if I'm you know, leasing land, what am I doing with it? Why would, I, why would I enter into a lease agreement? Yeah. Now you'd, maybe you specify in there that the tenant intends to do X, Y, and Z with the property. It's obligated for that. But other than that, if, I, if they say, well, the substance of the transaction was an installment sale of the property and there was no intent to treat it as a lease and that you've actually given them the ability to go in and construct buildings and things like that on there, you still lose. It's still going to be treated as a purchase. Yeah, that's, I've heard similar feedback, like regardless of what you call the document, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. So. Yeah, you see that a lot. I mean, I've been doing this for 23 years now and um, especially in RIAs, you, you guys will come in and they've got their 
box of forms and they're hey, let me just tell you the secret strategy here to do X, Y, and Z. And many times, I mean, it works. Stuff like that does work until you hit that one road bump where somebody's not paying, they challenge it, and then it starts to unravel on you. And many of those individuals that come up with these strategies, you know, I'll say, listen, is there an attorney that has backed this and has told you you can do this? What state is that attorney in? Do you have an attorney's opinion letter to, to, to back it up? Because if you don't, if the person that's telling you this doesn't, you should go to an attorney and ask the attorney. And I, and I understand, you know, a lot of times we don't like to use attorneys because I think more of them are more insult men than they are anything else because they don't, they're not up on it. So they're down on it. Um, they don't want to spend the time, but if you find the right guy and, you, and you're willing to pay that attorney, you know, some money to research it, then you'll get a solid answer. In a seller financing scenario, um, land contract specifically, is there a way for a seller to protect themselves legally if their buyer, or if the buyer, I combined it, uh, I combined two words there. If the buyer or borrower slash borrower, the same person, um, decides to do something illegal on the property, um, since it's titled in the name of the seller and not the buyer. So like if the person I'm selling the property to on land contract um, does something illegal on my property, am I, I'm obviously liable, right? Is there a way to protect me? Yeah, you want an indemnification clause in there. Uh, any waste that's committed on the property, they'd be responsible for. Yeah, you definitely want to contract that in. Um, so in the event that you had to enforce the agreement and they've been doing anything that jeopardizes your investment, yeah, so you'd put that in there. Buyer agrees not to X, Y, and Z. Buyer agrees not to A, B, and C. Yeah. Just like a mortgage, you know? Yeah. When you take out a mortgage, the lender... As you assert that you weren't, you're not going to run, you know, house of prostitution on the property or drugs and things like that, it's to protect their interest. So earlier, Clint, we had talked a little bit about this idea of putting a fence over somebody else's property and that kind of thing. Um, you guys like that? <laughs> well, it was actually one of our questions here. So from an, another perspective, so um, say if I buy a property that. I do have an easement to get to the property, cutting through somebody else's land, but that person has put up a fence and I can't get through they don't, my own easement. Um, what's the right way to proceed with gaining physical access to that property? Like, can I just cut their fence down or do I have to like go to a judge or do I go to them or do I call the cops or what do I do? Like, what's the right way to handle that? So my mother-in-law bought this piece of property on the Hood Canal, and it was, uh, let's say it was an acre or whatever, and there was two lots there. One of them had a house on it, and one of them, the other portion was just vacant. Was, so it was, you could, they're going to subdivide it. Her and her twin brother bought it. So they subdivided the property. Twin brother got the vacant lot. She got the house, and he built a house on this vacant land, this lot. And it just became a mess where their relationship then deteriorated because of the things that he was doing to his own sister, taking advantage of her, tapped into her drain field and screwed it up. She almost lost her CO on her house, tapped in her well. So she had to cut all that stuff off. And they had this stairwell that cut through the bulkhead that went down to the beach. And where they'd subdivided the land, it came through that stairwell, whereas the top two steps to go down were on, half of them were on her property. And then it continued on down through the bulkhead, which was her property. So in order for her to walk down to the beach, she had to then step onto his stairs to get down there. Now that was there, that's been there for probably 90 years, this bulkhead and the stair access. Well, the twin brother, He's pissed at his sister. He's just a jerk, my, my mother-in-law. He puts up a fence right on the property line, cuts right down to the, to the bulkhead on the stairs to block her access to the beach. Now, for him to get there, he had to kind of squeeze by this fence to go down the stairwell as it wraps around. And then he put that up, and I went out to her house one day, and I'm standing there, and I, and I see this. I said, Nancy, you can't allow this to go on because he's claiming that's his property. 
And if you allow him to keep that fence up, you will lose access to the beach. And she said, well, I don't know what to do. And I said, I'll show you what to do. And I went over there and I kicked it down. Pulled it right out. Actually, I didn't kick it down. I unscrewed everything, took it all up, and I stacked it on his property. So he came home. And he bashes himself as a tough guy. He says he's going to beat me up and all this stuff. I'm like, whatever, man. Do whatever you think you need to do. So he calls the police. Police come out. He said, hey. This guy over here, my sister's son-in-law, took my fence down. He trespassed on my property, blah, 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 blah. Officer looks at me and goes, what'd you do? I said, took his fence down. He's cutting off my mother-in-law access to the beach. We have an, a claim of right to that. It's been there for 90 years. He thought he could block her. He looks over at him and he says, you need to arrest him. He's like, this is a civil dispute. He goes, don't call me again. And the Washington State Patrol officer drove off. And that's the right response. That is a civil issue. So the thing about this is, yes, you would, you're going to have to enforce it eventually, but you're still within your claim of right to dismantle it. You don't want to kick it down. I, I would use loose terms there. Just take it down, put it on its property. He cannot block your access to it. He can try to sue you, all right, for using it, and then you go to court and you prove that you own it. Um, but that's the the the. The, the issue you're going to face, if you allow that to stand and you do not enforce your ownership rights, you will lose those ownership rights. Same thing happened at my old house with the Homeowners Association. We had access to a beach and, and ended up going through a guy that owned the, all this property. He wanted to develop it and he wanted to cut off our access and put up a fence and told us to go use some other access to the beach. I'm like, hell no. I'm still using that trail. I've maintained it with, we've done it for 18 years and you think you're going to stop us now? That ship sailed. But if we, and I told the homeowner associates, if we allow them to do this, you're going to lose access to the beach and you're going to have to go all the way around that other way where he said he created another path for you to gain access down to the beach. Yeah. Oh, I moved, but who knows? So you I mean, just to like escalate that situation and making it a ridiculous example about it. Cause this is what I do. Yep. So let's <laughs> say somebody put up like, I don't know, the Berlin wall over your easement access, or they built a house over your easement access. Like, can you really just like get a bulldoze through their house and say, no, nope, that's mine. Sorry. Civil dispute. Yeah, right. Can't call the caps. Like so at, what, at what point? <laughs> no, but when you see this going up, you should be taking steps immediately to prevent that. And I think that's the promise because when this happens with a lot of land flippers, like when they take possession of the property, the fence is already there. Like it's not like they ever had a chance to stop it. It's just the situation they inherited. Well, depending on how long that's been there, um, you may be screwed on that deal. Gotcha. In which yeah. case you'd have to like make a new easement or something or open up new negotiations with that person. It's tough. I mean, you could try to, you could take the prop, the fence down. I mean, so if it was my property, here's what I would do. I would take the fence down. If I knew it was on my property, I would take it down. I would force them to take action against me. I'm just not going to roll over and say, oh, well, I see you got your fence on my property. Let's negotiate this. Hell no. They have to start it. Now, when they approach me, then we'll discuss what we're going to do about that. They're probably going to get their attorney and they're going to make sure that they get an easement recorded against my property for access, or maybe they move for adverse possession. If they can show that they've been using that property for 10 years, and that fence has been up for that period of time. If they want to go that route, then it's going to be an expensive claim. And if I was, you know, depending on how much I spend on the land, I may just walk or try to sell it to them. Just say, Hey, whatever, just buy the property off and you can have the whole thing gets recoup some of your investment. Or maybe if, back from the purchase because in every situation where you try to fight these these claims they are expensive you're talking 30k in legal fees yeah. in a typical fight i mean my time is better spent flipping land than it is paying an attorney and i'll never get that money back yeah gotcha just a reminder nobody here is giving legal advice here informing you how you're supposed to start a war with your neighbors or any of that stuff. So, <laughs> but no, that, that's helpful though. That's, uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> now somebody in our Facebook group actually posted an interesting question. It's something that I've actually had experience with myself. Mm -hmm. So this person was buying a property worth 
a hundred thousand bucks and they had it under contract for ten thousand dollars to buy it from this person and they were closing through a title company and the title company uh, informed the seller i don't know if they called them or emailed them or what but said just so you know your property is worth a lot more than ten thousand bucks and it basically totally blew up the deal the deal died as a result of that um, and I've had this as well. In my case, it didn't kill the deal, but I did have a title company just talk to the seller and say, you know, your property is worth a lot more than this, right? Are you sure you want to do this? Like, that's what they said to the seller. And in my case, the seller was well aware of it. It was no, no surprise to them. So it went forward. Um, but when I hear that, it's just like, man, like. Who hired the title company? Uh, the buyer, I think, I assume. At least that's how my case worked. Yeah, so Is then it, there, there's no claim for you against that title company because that's the buyer's technical, say, agent. Mm -hmm. So they're in purview of contract with the buyer and they owe you no duty. However, if it was my title company and I would hire the, them for this and was paying for it and they told the buyer that, then you would have a claim against me. That, that's actually, maybe I didn't clarify. So this person, they were the buyer in the scenario. They were buying the property for... Uh, you know, dirt cheap. They were the ones that picked the title company. So like the person that they enlisted to help them told the other party and basically screwed up the deal. And in, in my mind, it's obviously that's a sign. Well, I've, you know, I'm never going to hire that title company again, but like, is there any legal recourse in that? Or they're really just sharing public information, I guess. I mean, it's not like it's, I can't see how it's technically illegal or anything. It's just a dumb move that really hurt their customer. Well, you, you have interference with the business expectancy and that by giving them that information, they knew that it would most likely lead to damages to you because you wouldn't be able to profit on that deal. So I would, I could bring that cause of action against. Them. So, yeah, I mean, there's some ways you could go eventually hold their feet to the fire on it. But I think it's a lot, a lot it's going to come down to is who's the title company representing. If they're not representing you, you didn't hire them. Um, and it was the, the seller who did it, then of course the seller would, would be protected there. But the buyer's title company, if I'm buying it and they go back to the seller, you know, we're having a conversation on that one. Yeah. Yeah, because that's that's like serious, serious damage, you know? But it's really messed up. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time, it's like when I look at like the ethical side of it, it's like really all that's happening here is just facts are being given around. So, I mean, maybe that person should have never done that in the first place, but I don't know. It's No, weird. I don't think that's facts because now they're, they're operating outside of their, their role in the transaction. Yeah. And they're not an appraiser. So that's a good point too. So, um, yeah, I think there's, there's definitely. Yeah. There's no intent too. So I want to actually circle back to um, something that you briefly touched on earlier about um, finding a good attorney in in a different state or i mean you said you guys have representation in all 50 states but um this is something that i've personally struggled with a lot um i uh, there was an actual um, agreement that i was trying to put in place like a, a a template that i could um use over and over again for to structure my um private money lenders coming in um on my land business and uh, I was cold calling attorneys for probably a couple, like I would take probably a good 30 minutes to call a couple attorneys uh, once or twice a week for about a solid month. And I just could not for the life of me uh, find anyone that really wanted to give me the time of day. Maybe they, they perceived me as like small fish or something, but um, I think it's, it's pretty hard to find an investor friendly attorney at least at least in my limited experience and so i really want to take some time to kind of like pick your brain as to what what should i be looking for how would you like start the the search for a new attorney? um what questions would you be asking and what are kind of the the qualifications that make uh that make a good attorney stand out compared to a mediocre one it's like anything in real estate i the way I often describe it is if you're going to hire someone to represent your interests or help you through a transaction, draft an agreement, you need to ask them, do they even understand it? And many times the way you can gauge whether or not the individual 
understands what it is you're doing is use the terms of art that are synonymous with your type of investing. So for example, land contract, right? Ask the attorney if they have any experience in drafting land contracts. And if they understand what, they're, what they are and what are the requirements in your particular state. If they say no, well, then you know right away that we can't help you in that area. So if that's what you want to do, it's not going to work for you. So you have to ask those deeper questions. You know, if you're house hacking, hey, you ever work with someone who house hacks? And if they t think that it's a, a legal activity, <laughs> then you know that's not the right guy to deal with. So first, you got to interview them, number one. Number two, where do you go to find them? Go to the local RIAs. You know, get gain act. Most of these things are online now. So you can go on there, ask, join one, ask questions. Hey, anybody got some uh, referrals for good real estate attorneys that they've been working with? That's a, that's a great place to start to try to find someone. If you can't go about it that way, go to wealthcouncil.com. So wealthcouncil.com, they are a purveyor of hot docs, document generation um, software for, for attorneys, for estate plans, LLCs, things like that. And the unique thing about it is they have attorneys all over the U.S. that are part of it. I'm part of it as well. And many of those attorneys are involved in estate planning. And what I found is that a lot of attorneys that are involved in estate planning, if they're just not exclusive estate planners, then they're typically also going to be transactional contract and real estate attorneys as well. For whatever reason, that just seems to kind of go hand in hand. So then you can call those guys up and just ask them, hey, does your firm handle this? What, what is the scope of your representation in dealing with real estate investors? You know, do you deal with flippers? So use the term flipper and see if they understand what that means. If they think it's an animal, right, from a television show, not the right group. So you have to be able to get that. The last thing I would tell you is this. The individual that calls up and wants free information, not, they're not going to deal with you, all right? They want serious people. So you have to be prepared to pay. Right? This is something that comes up a lot. You know, so our firm is set up where we give away free 30-minute strategy sessions. And, and a lot of times people will, on my YouTube, say, hey, Clint, I want to meet with you. Not going to happen because I have gatekeepers. I have you know, strategists. I have such a large organization. I can afford to do this where, where they filter the clients down and the only the ones that get to my level, I will then have a consultation with because I don't need to be meeting with everyone. I mean, people have aspirations, but they're not yet there. So for that attorney that's taking that call, they need to know that you're serious. And the best way to do that is pay for their time. And I would start with that. I want to spend, you know, I want to hire you for an hour. I want a one hour consultation. I'm willing to pay for it just to talk about these issues. Don't expect that it's going to be for free, but you can also ask the basic questions to begin with. Hey, plan contracts, are you familiar with this, this, this? If they say yes, they do that type of work. Great. Let me pay you for an hour of your time. So follow up question to that. One of the things that I, um, I have an attorney that I'm working with that I'm pretty satisfied with uh, overall. I mean, compared to my other experiences that I've had with attorneys thus far, he's been, you know, okay to work with for sure. But one of the big adjustments that was really hard, probably coming from, you know, being a millennial, being an internet based, just like culture and, and all of that. Um, he, his uh, response time is extremely delayed compared to what I'm used to. Um, you know, I, I have people who pay me for coaching as well, right? Like our, we have a coaching program, um, and where they have direct access to me and, um, I don't charge people per, for me responding to their emails. So like if one of his, this guy's biggest, uh, things is that, um, you know, I have to put him on retainer. And then if he responds to an email for me, he, he claims that, you know, it, he tries to justify it saying that. Oh, well, it takes 30 minutes of my time and I have like all this years of experience and knowledge. And there's some merit to that for sure. I, I understand that. But um, on my end, like I like my real estate agents, for example, that I work with, because I one of my uh, kind of distinction, uh, my, my distinct strategies that um, other people don't necessarily do, but I do in my land business is I work ex exclusively with land specialized real estate agents to sell property. I can text them 
at seven o'clock at night. I like I can and they might if they're busy, they won't get back to me until they're not busy. But like I have direct access to them. And if I need something, hey, check out this property or whatever. They're motivated to get back to me very quickly because they make money with me. I don't I haven't had that experience with um, with a lot of attorneys. And I'm just curious as to to, you know, maybe you could speak why that is um, on, on one side and then is it, um, I guess really what I'm after is what's the appropriate expectation of, um, professionalism or, or communication that, you, that a real estate investor should have with their attorney? I know this comes up a lot for friends of mine that are attorneys where their clients will sometimes complain about the fact they charge for emails. And so we don't do that at our firm because we, we're probably similar to what you do. We charge a flat fee. So when a client plays a flat fee, they don't have to worry about us charging them to send them an email or to pick up the phone and call them. Whereas the attorney now that responds via email, it used to be that would be over the phone. Now, a lot of people will send the attorney an email or possibly even a text message and think, well, because it's electronic, I don't have to pay you for that. So they have this different expectation that's involved. Well, the attorney's expectation is always that if I'm just answering emails and texts all day long, how am I going to ever make any money? Because if that's how my clients want to communicate with me, they don't expect me to charge them for that, and they're avoiding the phone call, then I go out of business. So they have to do it. I mean, maybe the better set strategy for that attorney is to say, yeah, that's a great question. Let's get on the phone and talk about it. And then you pick up the phone and talk about it. Then you feel better about getting billed because you were talking about it. That's how I would deal with those clients, by the way. Situation. Yeah, that's his MO actually. It's funny that that you brought that up cuz he he um he really he'll take like a week or longer sometimes to respond to an email, but um the the method to communicate with him is I have to talk to his his secretary, schedule a time to talk, and it's still normally like a week, but it, it's I don't know, I just find it uh frustrating that I I have I normally have intervals of like like a week or longer to wait before I can actually ask him a question or get a, a, an update on my case. I think a lot of that is, you know, when you grew you've grown up in, in an era where everyone, ex, a lot of people expect instant communication, gratification from whatever they're doing through social media and all. And for people who've been practicing that have that experience, they're not part of that. And, and they have not bought into that. And and I look at it from my own standpoint right now. If you send me a text, it's probably, I don't even know if I'd even respond. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. And if you get a response back, a lot of times it's going to be delayed. Why is that? Because I have phone, I have email where people can reach out to me. There's Facebook that they reach out to you, the YouTube, LinkedIn, text messages, Twitter. It gets to the point where you go, there's so many ways where people are trying to hit you that you have to pick and choose what's your most effective way to communicate with someone and then stick with those channels and train your clients how best to communicate with you and change their expectations. So if you have a client that's a Twitter, that or not a Twitter, but a, a, a texter, as an attorney, I would never accept that because I want that email there so I can correspond and look back through my emails. I mean, texts are hard to to go back and scroll through them. So they always want to keep a record of it as well. That's why they're going to use email. So I don't know if I've answered your question. I would just say maybe have a conversation with the attorney to see what the ex set the expectations and the boundaries at the front end, how you want to be communicated with and see if they're comfortable with it. Because I've actually told clients before that say, oh, I just want to be text. So I'm not the right guy for you because I'll never text you. And if you text me, probably I won't respond. You need to get a hold of me, contact my assistant. She'll set everything up. I don't have time to deal with creating the, con the consults with my clients. That's the least efficient use of my time. I can do it, but I'll just charge you for it. So, so that's, you know, I think the mentality that, that you're running into. Yes. It makes me feel better about the lack of response I've gotten from me about the different memes I've been texting you over the past <laughs> few days. I just, I mean, I took it really personally and it hurt for a while, but. I understand now, so I'm gonna. That's funny because that's the only thing I send out. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna choose to forgive and move on. Yeah. Um, 
Awesome. Well, and actually, I can totally relate to that. I've actually set up autoresponders on our Facebook pages and as many places where I can that just automatically respond and say, this is not a good place to get a hold of me. Send me an email here. Just so like, I don't even look at it. People just realize, oh, okay. I'm not going to hear from Seth if I talk to him here. Yeah. Well, that's an awesome idea. Yeah. Yeah, I can, I'll email you the little snippet that I use. It's been pretty effective. Yeah, that'd be great. I, yeah, I'd love to see that. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Not, not every social media thing lets you do autoresponders, but I know Facebook does. I think Instagram might. Don't quote me on that, but anyway, I'll send it to you. Yeah, yeah, right. Instagram now, I've got that. It's just, yeah, it's overwhelming. Yeah. Well, Clint, you've been very generous with your time. I really appreciate you helping us understand a lot of the looming questions that uh, real estate investors and land investors have. There's actually a lot of other stuff we didn't even get into that you're really good at in terms of like investing anonymously and hiding assets and that kinds of things and trust. Like there's all kinds of ninja moves this guy knows. Um, I actually saw, uh, I was trying to find it the other day and I couldn't find it, but there was a video series and it just like blew my mind. It was four different videos explaining all the ins and outs of land trusts. And it was just so well put and well articulated. So this guy is a wealth of information. Uh, I'm going to have a link to a couple different resources that he has available in the show notes for this episode at retipster.com forward slash 99, because this is episode 99. So feel free to check that out. Uh, Anderson advisors that uh, that's the main website and anything else people should uh, check out Clint. Yeah. Just check out my YouTube channel. I mean, just like your channel, you and I, are, we have the same philosophies. It's, it's about giving education. Yeah. Um, so, so people in the investors, you know, know how to use these tools, how to make the investment. And um, I'm an open book like you. And, and I want to give, as much as I can, because through that, people will be able to find success and will understand the nuances of doing what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Clint. Wish you all the best. Hopefully we'll talk again soon. Hey guys, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Darren, take care. You too. All right. So there it was, folks. That was that conversation with Clint. And uh, I don't know about you, Jaron, but I, that, that was a great conversation. Like, we didn't even cover everything that uh, was on our list, but we covered a lot of the uh, hot button topics that a lot of real estate investors and land investors, especially, are just always asking about. So. Yeah, and he was one of those just gifted uh, communicators that, you know, he just starts talking and you're just drawn in and you just want to listen. I don't know how people uh, cultivate that. You know, it's, it's something that I um, find very aspiring and admirable. It seemed like he had a story for like every question we had. That probably part of it. It was like Toastmasters. You're like he, he and he's like talking on the stage, and you're just having a normal conversation. Like I, I don't, I didn't pay attention too closely, but there were a couple times where I was noticing, huh? He hasn't said um and like or uh, you know, uh, like he he didn't do any of that. And I just like I don't know how to train myself out of that. I'm just, yeah. I mean, I'm just cursed to sound like a California guy hanging out. No. I don't know how to do that either, man. I, I, in every video I've ever done to this day, like I cannot get the ums and just the dumb filler words out of my, like I can edit them out, but like just live, I can't not do it. It's really hard. And I noticed a number of years ago, I was in Washington, DC and was doing that thing where you can sit up in the chairs and watch a Senate proceeding. And I noticed the politicians that I saw getting up and speaking, granted they're senators at like the federal level. So like they're as high as you can get, but still just in general, like politicians like that, a lot of them had this legal attorney background and like, they're so articulate. Like they just, they speak so clearly, like, like, man, like if I was practicing 10 times, I don't know that I could sound as good as these guys did. So maybe it's an attorney thing. Maybe in law school, like you just have to master that. Yeah, that would be a good skill to have. Let me tell you. He, uh, he definitely seems like somebody who will command a room if he uh, walks into it. So I, I really enjoyed it. I thought that was, it's rare to find an attorney that feels like a real estate investor. You know, like he felt more like, quote unquote, one of us than just like a runoff attorney. 
that could actually speak the legal language. So it was really good. Yeah. Yeah. And we were talking just for a couple of minutes after we stopped recording that conversation. So Anderson Advisors, the company that uh, Clint is, you know, one of the co co-founders of, I don't know if this makes sense for everybody, but they do have a service where they can help a person set up a new legal entity, like understand the specifics of their situation and where they're going and what they're trying to do. Uh, sometimes the recommendation might be, you don't need to do it yet. Like it's too soon. Just hang on until you've proven the concept to yourself. Um, or it could be, well, if you're doing this and that and that from this state and that state, then do this. So, um, there is sort of the cookie cutter approach. If you go through the RE Tips or Rocket Lawyer affiliate link, I mean, if you know what you want to do, there you go. It's pretty inexpensive and easy to do that. If you don't really know what you want to do, though, and if you want to get it right, and if you do have a little bit of money to spend, because it's definitely more expensive to work with Anderson Advisors, uh, you know who you are. So we're going to have an affiliate link to that service as well. Again, in the show notes at retipster.com forward slash 99. Before we move on, Seth, did anybody catch the, the flex in the conversation where Seth was like, oh, yeah, but according to this unknown like tax law, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, oh, yeah, I for he totally like flexed on the guy. Did you guys see that? I thought it was hilarious. The whole time I was like holding back my laughter. I was like, OK, Seth, go ahead. Go ahead and flex on the guy. <laughs> That was not intended to be any kind of uh, <laughs> one-upping him at all. That was just like, a, it was, it's a very, um, what do you call it? It's a thing that like 99% of people, even attorneys don't know about because it's such a niche thing. And it does matter a lot for land people. So um, he was right about what he said, but it was really important to insert that disclaimer. So I just thought I would go out of my way to say that. So. Clint, if you're listening to this, sorry, I wasn't trying to be a jerk. <laughs> uh, no, I, I was impressed. That was probably one of my uh, favorite uh, moments of all time in Ari Tips of History for, for me. That was hilarious. I thought about interrupting him and saying, hang on, stupid, and then telling him <laughs> that, but I didn't. <laughs> I, my people skills have, have developed a little bit further. I don't talk like that anymore. <laughs> All right, man. Well, here's our weird outro question for this episode. So what weird food combinations do you really enjoy? So for me, the first one that comes to mind isn't that weird if you're from California, but for other people, apparently it's like super off-putting. Um, growing up, I always have ketchup with my eggs, like always. Gross. Like you never heard Disgusting. of it? Disgusting. Well, I'm kind of overreacting because you said i was thought it was oh. well. <laughs> i was like oh. um no i've not i don't think i have heard of that i've heard of like hot sauce with eggs but not ketchup no yeah like i mean growing up everybody just that's what you do like you just that's what goes with eggs is ketchup this is a california so, thing you said yeah i mean unless it's just like a my house thing but i'm a, <laughs> like i'm just assuming that it was not out of the ordinary like it wasn't like putting ketchup on peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or something. It's just like ev most people did that growing up. And that was like the normal condiment with eggs. So I always have ketchup with my eggs. Always. Yeah. Have you ever had ketchup that does not have sugar added to it? Yeah, it's nasty. <laughs> it's disgusting. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Why would anybody eat that stuff, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, for me, Basically, everybody I've ever told this to has just recoiled in disgust at this idea. But I ate this pretty regularly when I was a kid. I, I haven't eaten this in probably 30 years now. So it's been a long time. But I used to eat a jelly and cheese sandwiches. What do you got to say about that, Jaren? Are you going to? Well, I don't know. My, my dry default... heave or anything? <laughs> no, I don't know. My, my default in life is always to remain open minded. So. Uh, because I'm I I don't have any context as to what that would taste like. Um, my response is I I think I need to try it before I can come to a conclusion as to whether or not it's gross. Yeah, it was slices of like cheddar cheese, I think, and grape jelly specifically. That's what it was, and hmm. um, I I never thought anything of it. Like I, 
it's not like I thought it was amazing, but like it wasn't bad. I mean, essentially what it is is like sugar and fat mixed together because that's yeah. what and sugar and fat is usually pretty tasty. So I just thought it was fun. But, yeah, and and then like. There are all those cheeses out there that have like fruit infused in them, like inf- fruit infused goat cheese and stuff, like blueberries and oh, okay. gotcha. cranberries and stuff. Yeah. So, like, I don't know, it doesn't sound that off. Yeah. I don't know. Well, thank you for not making me feel like <laughs> such a, <laughs> such a barbarian. I mean, I used to have some really weird food habits as a kid, like going into it. Like, uh, I brought up ketchup and peanut butter jelly sandwiches because that was uh, a thing. I had ketchup. I was a, obsessed with ketchup growing up absolutely hate tomatoes to this day cannot my wife the other day she made me an omelet and she was like really trying to impress me and so she put like tomatoes in there like when not telling me <laughs> I literally took a bite not knowing what was in it i was like oh it's not cooked taste it and she's like what are you talking about it's a tomato so i can't uh, it's weird but i i had an affinity with ketchup i had ketchup on everything as a kid have you have you're like have your taste buds changed much from childhood to adulthood? Because for me, tomatoes were like, I like, I think I remember almost throwing up on a few occasions from eating tomatoes and mushrooms. Like, as, again, as a child, I don't know what it was, but it just like triggered some gag reflex. But now, like, I'm totally cool with both. Like, I, I'll eat them for fun. And it's, I don't know what, what changed, but at some point, like a, a switch flicked and I, have different opinions now yeah i was a real picky eater as a kid but um i grew out of that and i pretty much eat everything um except for tomatoes like tomatoes are uh, and corn like so here's the thing tomatoes i absolutely are absolutely repulsive to me like they i take one it's the texture it's not necessarily the taste the texture just does something that just makes my skin crawl um (laughs) there are other things that i don't like I will eat and it's fine, but it's not like my go-to preference. Like I don't really like corn on the cob or like avocados necessarily, but it's like, I, I eat avocados every week. Cause my wife is like, here, try this avocado thing, you know, that I'm making. And so that's cool. But like, um, the one thing that is like absolutely repulsive, like I can't, I've tried, I've, I've consistently and continue to try every once in a while, I'll eat a tomato and try to stomach it. And for whatever reason, the texture. I like, guess uh, small cherry tomatoes are a lot more palatable. They're still not like my favorite, but they're a lot more palatable because the texture is a lot more crisp. But just biting into like a mushy, nasty red, yeah, it's not my thing. Did, did you say corn? Something you don't like? Yeah, corn on the cob. Yeah, like so corn on the cob. It's not like I dislike it, but it's not like my. I don't sit there and be like, oh, you know, it'd be amazing right now, steak and corn on the cob. Like, I'm just, I'm, I'm so, not a so big fan of the cob specifically is the problem, but yeah. just corn in general is fine. Yeah, I mean, it's like yeah. again, it's fine. Like, I'll if I go to somebody's house or some, you know, or I'm like sitting there and my wife wants corn on the cob, like we'll get corn on the cob every once in a while. But it's not, it's just not something that I'm like super. Like, my wife loves it, and a lot of people love corn on the cob. Put butter on it and the whole well, thing. I was just gonna say because. Corn is like in everything. There's like an abundance. Oh yeah, of, I like corn. corn in like chips and you know. Yeah, no, I'm good with corn. Things. I'm totally good with that. Yep. Cool. Awesome. Well, I learned something new about you today. I know. I we get real personal on these uh yeah. these uh end of podcast things, right, Seth? <laughs> well, it, my my wife is actually the same way. Like when we go to Chick Fil A or whatever, whatever I order, I have to specify no tomatoes. Like that's a huge no no to get a tomato on anything so yeah you're like that too it's good to know (laughs) and maybe it might be a genetic thing like maybe there's like a small portion of the population that where was allergic to tomatoes or something i don't know yeah yeah it's probably like most issues in life like so much of it is in your head like it can absolutely be overcome but there's like something some puzzle in your brain that needs to get unscrambled or thought of differently and that's that's hard to do. Like that is a hard thing to just snap your fingers and think differently all of a sudden. Again, listeners and viewers, thanks for listening and watching. Hope you guys enjoyed the conversation here. Again, go check out the show notes. There's links to a lot of important stuff we talked about uh, at retipster.com forward slash 99. And uh, if you want to stay up to date on some other things we got going on at retipster, Take out your phone and text the word free, F-R-E-E, to the number 33777.
and uh, I dare you to do it. And you'll see what happens. <laughs> so thanks again for listening. Talk to you guys later. Thank you.